Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, Two interviews, and they're both powerhouses. We talk with Beyond Nuclear's Kevin Camps, who translates and interprets for us last week's devastating Nuclear Regulatory Commission session, which slid through the cracks while we were all looking ahead to the three-day Labor Day weekend. Conflict of interest, grounds for congressional intervention, short-sightedness as to people, the environment, and the future of our genetic material. It's a mess worthy of a soap opera, courtesy the NRC. And Kevin Camps cuts through the bovine feces to the hardcore truth. Then, what has been going on at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, in the more than six months since the Valentine's Day radiation leak? We check back with Don Hancock of Southwest Information and Research Center to hear what has and has not happened to the 22 confirmed exposed workers, and then puts Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz's bovine feces in historical perspective. Plus, we of course have numbnuts of the week, activist shout-outs, Ginzu knives, uh, no, not really any Ginzu knives, they're made in Japan and we really don't want them here, and much, much more coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, September 2nd, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. We'll start out in Japan this week, where Tokyo Electric Power Company is saying oops all over again. That's because on Friday, August 29, during a remotely controlled operation to remove debris from the spent fuel pool at Unit 3 at Fukushima Daiichi, the operating console of the fuel handling machine slipped loose and fell into the pool, adding more debris. The console which is about 1 meter wide and 1.6 meters high, weighing 400 kilograms, or to translate that into American, is 3 feet wide by 5.5 feet high and weighs 881 pounds, was being moved by TEPCO in attempts to clean up the site. This according to one of their spokesmodels. At this time, the company is unable to say whether the accident further damaged any of the plutonium lace fuel rods, of which 566 still remain in the Unit 3 spent fuel pool. TEPCO said it had not detected any significant changes in radiation readings or in the level of the pool water in the number 3 reactor. They did not define what they meant by significant as opposed to insignificant, And they also didn't bother to say whether they were looking for radiation at all, simply that they had not detected any. In a blatant reminder of the ongoing fragility of the area, only hours after the accident happened, a magnitude 5.0 quake struck off the Fukushima coast, adding insult to planetary injury. Less than three and a half years since the Fukushima Daiichi disaster began, Thyroid cancer rates have soared in Fukushima Prefecture, with 104 young people having been diagnosed already. This is an average of 34.8 people per population of 100,000 having definitive or suspected thyroid gland cancer. This figure is much higher than the average rate of thyroid cancer of 1.7 people per 100,000 among those in their late teens. Experts, remember those nuclear experts who so often get it wrong, experts are divided over whether the cases of thyroid gland cancer should be linked to the 2011 nuclear accident. Dudes, what other variable is there that would account for such a dramatic increase in cancer rates? By means of comparison, Nagasaki University conducted screening tests on thyroid cancer in contaminated areas in Chernobyl and found that there were 31 cases of thyroid cancer out of 100,000 people tested in Korosten in the state of Zhivnomir and 22 cases of thyroid cancer in Kiev in Ukraine. So all you experts in Japan, 
Nuclear accident happens. Thyroid cancer rate increases. It happened in Chernobyl. You might want to consider it in relationship to your increased rates of thyroid cancer in proximity to Fukushima. In case you needed a reminder as to how lethal Fukushima remains, on August 28th, TEPCO admitted that still flowing into the water of the ocean daily from Fukushima Daiichi is water containing 5 billion becquerels of strontium-90, 2 billion becquerels of cesium-137, and 15 billion becquerels of tritium making the total daily outflow into the port 22 billion becquerels of radiation. It's been that way from the start, and it continues to this day. For the first time, a court in Japan found nuclear power company TEPCO can be held responsible for the suicide of a woman who was forced to evacuate her home after the 2011 Fukushima disaster began. The court ordered TEPCO to pay $470,000 to Mikio Watanabe and his children after his 58-year-old wife, Hamako, killed herself a few months after the nuclear meltdown in the wake of the earthquake and tsunami forced them out of their home and destroyed their livelihoods. This ruling marks the first time that TEPCO has been found liable for a suicide resulting from the accident and it could galvanize others seeking redress from the company. Watanabe said at a news conference after the ruling last Tuesday, I think we received a meaningful ruling that's consistent with our feelings. The family's suffering and pain are rewarded. When I return home, I'd like to report the result to Hamako's portrait and tell her to have a good rest. The family's attorney declared the verdict a complete victory. For its part, TEPCO, which has been widely faulted for its slow and muddled response to the disaster, issued an apology. Yoshimi Hitoshugi, a spokesman for the company, said, We apologize from the bottom of our hearts again that the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident is causing much inconvenience and concern to Fukushima prefectural residents and many people. What thesaurus did he or his writers go through to come up with those mashed potato, mush mouth descriptions for the worst nuclear accident in the history of the earth and the devastation that it has wrecked upon the Japanese people? Oh, and the rest of us as well. Inconvenience. Concern. He went on to say, also, we offer our sincerest prayers for the late Mrs. Hamako Watanabe's soul. And then went on to say, we will closely examine the content of the ruling and continue to respond sincerely. Yes, I'm sure all sincerity will be reserved for your shareholders and executive bonuses. This ruling does mark a major blow to TEPCO. Legal action relating to the accident has been limited in part because Japanese courts do not allow for class action cases or punitive damages and partly because of a five-decade-old nuclear accident law limiting liability to the plant operator, not unlike Price Anderson, which we have here in the United States. And by the way, if you haven't checked your homeowner's insurance, under the standard exemptions, you will find anything that happens to your home or property because of a nuclear accident. Just thought it was the right time to slip that little factoid in. Getting back to the compensation variables when it comes to those people whose lives were most deeply impacted by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, this piece of bad news. The Japanese Governmental Nuclear Damage Claim Dispute Resolution Center, which is tasked with reaching out-of-court settlements for individual claims filed over the Fukushima nuclear plant meltdowns, has set compensation uniformly at 50% this according to a document obtained by the Manichi Shimbun. The center calculates the total amount of damages for pain and suffering in individual settlement proposals. Of course, the center denied that the 50% rule had been an official practice. But on July 9th, the Manichi Shimbun reported that Hiroshi Noyama, 
former head of the Nuclear Damage Claim Dispute Resolution Mediation Office, had attested during an interview that, quote, the decision had been made to assess the contribution ratio of the nuclear accident to the deaths at around 50%. And, of course, the center continued to deny it, most recently through Noyama's successor, Joji Danto, a former judge. He said, I don't know what Noyama said, but there are no rules in place. However, the four-page document obtained by the Manichi Shinbun, dated December 26, 2012, what a Christmas present, includes the following statement, quote, Compensation shall be set across the board at 50%. Fine adjustments, such as setting the figure at 40 or 60%, shall not be made. End quote. The document additionally reveals the possibility for individual settlement proposals to be set at lower amounts, saying, when it is difficult to ascertain that the 50% rule should be applied, it is possible, as an exception, to set the figure at 10% for pain, suffering, disruption of life, and, oh yes, on occasion, death. The document additionally notes that details such as medical records or opinions from doctors shall not be taken into significant consideration when deciding final compensation amounts. Of course not. Why bother with the truth when you can fall back on a sociopathic lie? The testimony of Masao Yoshida, who was chief of the Fukushima nuclear plant on March 11 of 2011, and the man who called for the Fukushima 50 to stay and fight the disaster, which is probably why the rest of us are still alive today, has finally been published. At least a serial version of nine articles that appeared on Asahi Shinbun Digital have been translated into English and are available in both English and Japanese. He said in sworn testimony before his death that he feared the core meltdowns he was trying to contain would cause catastrophic damage to eastern Japan. He said, I thought we were really dead. Yoshida said that he was bracing for the worst, a total failure in which the fuel melts and breaches both the pressure vessel and the containment vessel. But air pressure in the containment vessel dropped, allowing fire engines to get the water in, making Fukushima more of a slow-motion catastrophic disaster that the world has been manipulated into ignoring for the most part. Yoshida died on July 9, 2013, of esophageal cancer, something that TEPCO insists has nothing to do with the level of radiation Yoshida was exposed to from Fukushima Daiichi as he fought the disaster. We will have a link up to the English translation of the articles on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, under the podcast blog page, episode number 167. Over to the United States, where there is a major science meeting on Fukushima's link to wildlife problems on the west coast of North America. During an interview with Kristen Milligan, Oregon State University marine ecologist, she said that there is currently an international group of scientists in either Boston or Washington, D.C., who are just finishing up this week looking at the radiation in the environment from Fukushima and how it impacts on wildlife in the Pacific. They are working to try to create a risk assessment model and said there's all these different stresses happening, and certainly Fukushima is one of them. Scientists are looking closely at the question of to what extent the radiation is coming into the areas along the West Coast, where these current ecological problems in wildlife are showing up, and trying to balance that with all the other known problems out there. When results from this confab of scientists comes to the fore, we'll cover it for you on Nuclear Hot Seat. Millstone Nuclear Power Plant in Waterford, Connecticut, is living up to its name because, boy, is it a millstone around the necks of those people who have the misfortune of living downwind of it. When Millstone's Units 2 and 3 went into simultaneous emergency shutdowns on May 25th of 2014, 
Operator Dominion told the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission that its on-site radiation monitors, quote, are indicating normal levels. At the same time, when Dominion had declared an emergency with the sudden loss of off-site power, the NRC's public affairs officer, Neil Sheehan, one of their spokesmodels, assured Connecticut news media all safety systems functioned as designed and there were no health or safety issues to the public as a result. Then the NRC began a special investigation. And guess what? Dominion lied. Big surprise there. The NRC found that Dominion committed what they called a white level violation of federal regulations, which is the second up on a scale of four. This will put Millstone under NRC oversight. I really wish they would start using the word supervision instead of oversight so that they don't overlook anything. But they will be under additional NRC oversight for a year or more. However, Buried in the August 28, 2014 inspection report and unreported by the news media is the previously withheld information that, quote, cascading equipment errors led to unexpected radioactive gaseous releases through the reactor's ventilation system and elsewhere at Unit 3. Unexpected releases of cancer-causing radioisotopes into the air we breathe, a matter of health and safety, and, oops, everybody forgot to mention it. But, hey, the stuff's invisible so they can get away with it. No, or not. Now, the NRC did not reveal the quantity of radioactive gases released, nor identify the radioisotopes. The NRC said the information will not be made available to the public until Dominion releases its annual radioactive effluence report next April, nearly a year after the event. But what's wrong with this is what Dr. Ian Fairley discussed in Nuclear Hot Seat number 165 just two weeks ago when he pointed out that by averaging out radiation exposures over the course of a year, it flattens out those times when the radiation releases are at their greatest. Dr. Fairley pointed out that that was usually when the fuel rods were being switched out so there would be a sudden spike in radiation. Here we have a spike of radiation, but by the time there's going to be any information put out to the rest of us about how much there was, it will be flattened into an average for the year. Not exactly protecting people in the environment, NRC. Additionally, although Dominion submitted its 2013 radiological effluence report on time in April, the NRC withheld the report from the public for four months and did not release it until after pressure was brought to bear on them by Connecticut Coalition Against Millstone. But it's not only the public that was put at risk, an untold number of Millstone workers suffered unusual radiation exposures to their bodies during the event. This according to the NRC inspection report. And if that's not screwy enough, here's this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, Nuclear Hot Seed, None that sound awake. As if we don't have a big enough problem with nuclear waste that we generate in our own country, did you know that the U.S. does not allow any country that it gives nuclear technology to to generate power with their reactors without also promising to return its waste to us? Must have something to do with all that weapons-grade plutonium that's the side effect of nuclear power reactors, unless they're meant to create weapons-grade plutonium and energy is the side product. Much of this plutonium-laced stock is stored at the Savannah River site near Aiken, South Carolina. But now, SRS is planning to import 23,000 liters of liquid high-level waste from the Chalk River Laboratories in Canada. According to SRS Watch News, this waste would end up in the already stressed high-level waste tank system. And then what do we do with it? There is no post-nuclear era. This stuff ain't going away, and we have no plans. Tra-la, tra-lay. 
And that's why the Savannah River site and this whole screwy concept is this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound awake. In Germany, in the early morning of August 18, activists chained themselves to railroad tracks in Hamburg, blocking a train for five hours which carried more than 50 containers of uranium ore concentrate. One of the participants explained, We block nuclear transports because they are the Achilles heel of the nuclear industry. We want the shutdown of all nuclear plants worldwide and immediately. We also fight for a world in which such inhuman technology is not possible. No reports of arrests or police violence. After all, this is Germany. And finally, research results have been published by the Chernobyl Research Initiative, which compares changes that took place after Chernobyl's accident with some of the changes already tracked from Fukushima. Highlights from the research include population sizes and number of species, meaning biodiversity of birds, mammals, insects, and spiders, are significantly lower in areas of high contamination in Chernobyl. For many birds and small mammals, lifespans are shorter and fertility is depressed in areas of high contamination. In Fukushima, only birds, butterflies, and cicadas showed significant declines during the first summer following the accident. Many species show evidence of genetic damage stemming from acute exposures, and the differences observed between Fukushima and Chernobyl suggests some species may show the consequences of mutation accumulation over multiple generations. We'll have a link up to this complete report on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, on the podcast blog page. We'll have our featured interviews in just a moment. But first, Nuclear Hot Seat relies on your donations, yes, you, to keep us going, growing, and giving you every week's nuclear news, the interviews, hopefully a chance to laugh a little bit, everything that gets provided by this podcast. I'm extremely grateful to those of you who donate because you're the ones who are keeping this going. I cannot meet the expenses by myself. Now, any one of you can make either a single donation or a small recurring payment to help support the show. When you feel moved to do so, go to NuclearHotSeat.com, scroll down on the homepage, and click on the red donate button. Know that I deeply appreciate any help you can give me because, for example, without your support, I wouldn't have been able to go down to San Diego last week and cover the hearings of the USS Ronald Reagan sailors. So help where you can, when you can, and if you can't send money, at least say something nice. Last week, right before the three-day Labor Day weekend, The Nuclear Regulatory Commission held a session to allow for its four commissioners, including the terminally compromised William Magwood, in his last acts before taking an overtly pro-nuclear job, to make some monumental decisions about all our nuclear futures. Who better to interpret the results than Beyond Nuclear's Kevin Camps? Kevin specializes in high-level waste management and transportation, new and existing reactors, decommissioning, Congress Watch, climate change, and federal subsidies. He's Tom Hartman's favorite nuclear commentator and mine as well. Listen closely, and you'll understand why. Kevin Camps, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thanks so much for having me. The NRC last week met on August 26th the Tuesday before Labor Day weekend, which is a great time to bury any significant news. And at that time, they approved the continued storage of spent nuclear fuel generic environmental impact statement and rule, which is a lot of words for what was formerly called nuclear waste confidence. Would you tell us what this approval consisted of and what it means? Well, this is the culmination in NRC's eyes of this long process starting in June of 2012, where the federal courts, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, based on a lawsuit brought by a coalition of states and environmental groups, the court ordered the NRC to vacate its nuclear waste confidence policy. But what they've done, these two years later, 
is to ignore the court orders, ignore tens of thousands of public comments, and largely just bless what they had before. And what's really significant, though, is that they are not standing by any safety assurances or environmental assurances that used to exist under nuclear waste confidence for things like ultimate disposal, permanent disposal. All they're standing by in terms of it's safe, it's sound, keep making more radioactive waste is the time period from the day a reactor shuts until 60 years later. That's the decommissioning period. It's as long as the waste can stay in the pools. So they'll stand by that. And then in their science fiction fantasy world, they're standing by the safety and security and soundness of keeping the waste on site in dry casks forever. I am not exaggerating. They stand by forever dry cask storage on site or even away from reactors at parking lot dumps. This sounds like a devastating decision that they came to. Is there any way that this can be challenged? Yes, indeed. And I, based on the statements I've seen in the media and uh, from gatherings of environmental groups, I would say that many of the same parties that brought the lawsuit in the first place, that would include states like the state of New York, the state of Vermont, environmental groups like NRDC, and even a coalition of some three dozen environmental groups represented by Diane Curran, an attorney here in Washington, as well as Mindy Goldstein, who's with Turner Environmental Law Clinic at Emory in Atlanta. This is such a violation of the court orders from 2012 that I think there will be lawsuits coming. I can't speak on behalf of any of those states or attorneys, uh, but I would say that Beyond Nuclear, for one, is ready to go back to court. This is such a violation of the mandate to the NRC, at least the public face of the mandate, to protect people and the environment. Because in essence, they are saying full speed ahead with all things nuclear. There's not going to be any delays of nuclear reactor license extensions. They're going to approve new reactor construction and operating license applications. Why in the world? What is the motivation behind this from what is supposed to be our regulatory body? Well, I'm glad you mentioned that other side of the coin. I mentioned the nuclear waste confidence rubber stamp that this represents. But the other side of that coin was there was a hold on all those proceedings you mentioned, license extension proceedings, new reactor licenses. And what they did last Tuesday was they lifted all the holds. So the way this is going to go down is sometime this month, they're going to publish in the Federal Register their decision. And 30 days later, after it appears in the Federal Register, all of those holds are over. And, for example, in the Davis-Bessey, Ohio, license extension proceeding in which we're an intervener, that licensing board has teed this thing up at the finish line. They couldn't go over the finish line. I would not be surprised if on day 30 in October that they take it across the finish line. Explain to the listeners what crossing the finish line means. They would grant the 20-year license extension. We've been fighting it since December 27th of 2010, so for several years now. And they are poised to just give that 20-year license extension away to one of the most risky reactors in the country. And so we're trying to keep that proceeding alive. We have a contention going in at midnight tonight. That's our deadline to try to keep that proceeding alive. It's based on the cracking of the concrete containment. It's called the shield building at Davis Bessey. It's severely cracked. We've known that since late 2011. The cracking is getting worse. And we have been steamrolled at every turn trying to raise this issue in the license extension proceeding. Effectively, that shield building could crumble, could topple, could fall down under the stress of an additional uh, load like an earthquake or a terrorist attack or an internal meltdown. Speaking of compromises, it's not just the facilities, it's not just the rulings that seem to be compromised, but there's the issue of Commissioner William Magwood. As of today, former Commissioner William Magwood, but he was a compromised lame duck 
who just began a new job as director general of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development's Nuclear Energy Agency, which exists solely to promote nuclear energy. I know that Beyond Nuclear asked him to step down before engaging in rulings and also taking back any rulings while he was applying for this job, but yet he stayed in place and was part of these decisions that were just made, even though he is, to put it mildly, completely suspect in the objectivity of his rulings. Yes, and there are federal laws and regulations, including at NRC, prohibiting such a conflict of interest. This is not just the appearance of a conflict. It is an actual conflict because the Nuclear Energy Agency is an international promotional institution promoting nuclear power. He's going to be its director. He applied for that job the better part of a year ago. And in fact, Beyond Nuclear, joined by a 100 other organizations, we tried to prevent Commissioner Magwood's appointment in the first place. We protested Obama's nomination. We protested the Senate confirmation. This is way back five years ago in 2009. And so, again, uh, Diane Curran and Mindy Goldstein, on behalf of three dozen environmental groups, months ago began calling for Magwood's recusal back to the beginning of his courting for this job and, of course, his immediate resignation as soon as he was uh, granted this uh, directorship. He uh, was unabashed. He stayed in the agency as long as he could. And in fact, to the very day that he left to go to Paris to join the Nuclear Energy Agency. Are there any laws or rules or anything in place that can be used to perhaps reverse his position or take him out of the equation? Well, uh, part of our call was for the Office of Inspector General at the NRC to look into this grave transgression. And the OIG, as it's called, is supposed to look into NRC wrongdoing, including by commissioners. And, you know, ultimately, this could result in a Department of Justice investigation. And that was mentioned in our coalition letters to the OIG. If that does take place, is there any chance at all that these decisions that were made by the NRC with Commissioner Magwood, now former Commissioner Magwood, involved could be reversed or could be put on hold for further examination? Technically, yes, but unfortunately, the OIG, which is supposed to be independent of the agency that it investigates, is uh, captured by the NRC, much like the NRC itself is captured by the industry. So, I would be surprised if the OIG does the right thing based on many years of experience in that regard. Unfortunately, the collusion is widespread. Um, All of these checks and balances that are supposed to protect us are broken at this point. And, you know, the Japanese parliament did an investigation on the Fukushima catastrophe, and their root cause determination was collusion between regulator and industry which is exactly the situation that we have here. We have it in spades. Let's take a look at where NRC Chair Allison McFarlane was in all of this, because she logged a partial objection that NRC staff had not adequately considered the quote-unquote catastrophe, that was her word, that would unfold over time if institutional control were to be lost over irradiated nuclear fuel storage. And yet... When the vote came, she joined in approving finalization of the GEIS and the rule, pending some very minor corrections. What's the deal with her? Well, that's a really good question. Allison McFarlane is a Ph.D. geologist, and certainly earthquakes have a big role in these decisions about safety and risk long term. So, While it's appreciated that she pointed out that institutional control could very well be lost over long periods of time into the future, something her staff wouldn't even consider adequately in its generic environmental impact statement that the NRC just blessed, it's it's quite astounding to me that she would simply vote in favor of going ahead with this blessing of nuclear waste confidence effectively. And, you know, Looking big picture, though, she was on the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future, which pretty much did say that everything's fine. Everything's fine at the reactor sites with pools and dry casks, and everything will be fine with away from reactor parking lot dumps. In fact, we should speed that process up in a big way. So in a a way, she is being very consistent. Um, I guess she is a part of this nuclear establishment, and she just voted 
with the other three commissioners, four to zero in favor of a very bad policy and very likely a legally deficient policy. And I think what the four NRC commissioners are daring the public to do and even state governments is sue us, take us back to court. And the gamble that NRC is wagering is that they can race through all of these remaining uh, licenses, license extensions and new reactors before the attorneys representing the public interest can get a court injunction. That's NRC's defiance of the court order. That's their gamble. And there's no way to turn them around once these have been granted? NRC Chairman Greg Yasko, uh, McFarland's predecessor, once told me at a meeting at the Palisades Nuclear Plant in Michigan, he shrugged his shoulders and he said, Kevin, once the NRC grants a license, there's really not much the agency can do, which is all the more reason for the NRC to so very carefully make its decisions about licensing and nuclear waste confidence being rubber stamped is a huge violation of that. It takes the radioactive waste issue off the table in all licensing proceedings. Wow. Now, you've been involved in some conversations today. Can you bring us up to date on the latest news or the latest things that you can share about this process as it moves forward? At Davis Bessey, um, this is the continuation of our intervention against the 20-year license extension. We're nearly four years into this intervention. And what happened today was we have a deadline of tonight at 11.59 Eastern time to file our latest contention on shield building cracking. And it's required before you file a contention that you undertake a sincere consultation with the other side, in this case, First Energy Nuclear Operating Company and the NRC staff, which has opposed us at every turn in our intervention. So our attorney, Terry Lodge of Toledo, myself, and Michael Keegan of Don't Waste Michigan, for our side, were on the phone with First Energy and NRC's attorneys, and they made it clear, First Energy saying they would absolutely oppose this new contention, NRC saying they'll wait to see the contention, and of course, then they will oppose it. And uh, it's a pro forma undertaking This is supposed to save time for the licensing board if we can convince the other side to agree with us that our contention has merit for a hearing. That never happens. (laughs) So it's really, a you know, it's another kangaroo court process that we're put through. And we will be filing at 11.59 p.m. tonight. And this is to keep our proceeding alive until uh, we can try to challenge this nuclear waste confidence decision because it is also a a lingering contention that's in this proceeding that they're trying to get rid of as fast as possible. I always refer to it as the nuclear waste, no confidence. What can listeners to Nuclear Hot Seat do, if anything, to support you beyond nuclear and support anything we possibly can to turn this around with the NRC? Well, I would say, especially for California residents, but for any American, to contact Senator Barbara Boxer's office, either directly at Senator Barbara Boxer's office uh, on the Hill or at her, uh, it's called the uh, Environment and Public Works Committee, which she chairs in the U.S. Senate, and urge her to hold uh, comprehensive hearings on this nuclear waste confidence fiasco that just went down. I know that she plans hearings in the very near future on earthquake risks at Diablo Canyon. I know she plans hearings on, now it's two replacements for the NRC Commission now that Magwood is gone, Apostolakis has been gone for some time. But she also needs to hold hearings on this nuclear waste confidence collusion between the NRC and industry. If there's any wording that can be provided by Beyond Nuclear, I'll be happy to post a link up on the website to give the listeners a leg up on what they can send as an email or say on the phone. I'd be happy to. And, you know, there is some hope at the uh, Environment and Public Works Committee with Boxer as chairman, with Markey from Massachusetts, with Sanders from Vermont. Finally, some champions for public health and safety in the environment with oversight on the NRC. What a concept. One can only hope. Maybe miracles do happen. Kevin, anything you'd like to add at this time? I would just encourage folks to jump into these fights. These decisions will affect all future generations. Every ton of high-level radioactive waste that's generated is a curse on all future generations, and they're making 20 tons per year at each reactor. We've got to stop it. 
because once it's made, we got to figure out how to keep it out of the environment forevermore into the future. And that is a, a curse to lay upon future generations. That was Kevin Camps from Beyond Nuclear. We will post Kevin's proposed wording to Senator Barbara Boxer as soon as we receive it from him. And you will find it on our website, nuclearhotseat.com, on the podcast blog page under episode number 167. Here's our second interview, and it's one we've been covering regularly since it first happened. The ongoing story that has barely received notice in mainstream media this time is that of the February 14, 2014 radiation leak at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, a site that is also known as WIP. Nuclear Hot Seat was there from the beginning and was shocked to learn last week that the Environmental Protection Agency reviewed the air testing data that was released by the WIP site, and lo and behold, it was so bad that the EPA actually declared many of the missteps. We're not shocked about the missteps as much as about the fact that the EPA even mentioned them. To give us a closer read as to what's going on or not going on, Regarding this ongoing nuclear danger spot, we spoke again with Don Hancock, Executive Director of the Nuclear Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's been a regular source on this story, and as usual, he had a lot of light to cast on our understanding of what's going on. Don, welcome back to Nuclear Hot Seat. Thank you. There have been some startling revelations over the past week about the radiation samples that were not taken at the WIP site. Can you bring us up to speed to general knowledge? We've known for more than six months since the time of the release that DOE didn't have accurate monitoring because their monitoring was reporting there was no, there were no releases and no worker contamination and no equipment contamination. That was wrong. And we've known that neither EPA nor the state of New Mexico had any monitoring at the time of the release. So the only real independent monitoring that there was at the time of the release, before the release, at the time of the release, and subsequently was from the Carlsbad Environmental Monitoring and Research Center. So that's not new information. The New Mexico Environment Department has had monitoring stations in and around the WIP site since before WIP opened. In other words, more than 15 years' worth of data, but they stopped collecting data and doing laboratory sampling last June, June of 2013. So the Environment Department from July of 2013 till February 21st of 2014, a week after the release, didn't have any of their monitors working and doesn't have laboratory sampling. So that source of regulatory information and information to the public just doesn't exist for that time period. I recall from one of our earliest interviews you saying that there was the possibility of bringing in portable monitors that, if I'm remembering this correctly, were first not brought in, and then when they were brought in, were not placed in alignment with the wind patterns at the time of the radiation release. Can you comment further on that? Yeah, this has always been a a problem. Both EPA and the New Mexico Environment Department have mobile monitors, in other words, monitors that can be moved from location to location as opposed to stationary monitors, monitors that are always in the same place sampling. So it wasn't until the Environment Department brought in one of their mobile monitors a week after the release, EPA was later than that. So again, we don't have, we didn't have contemporaneously and didn't have at the time or near the time of the release that kind of information. So that's a problem. The other thing that's just important for people to understand is the only monitoring on the salt shaft, the only radiation monitoring on the salt shaft is the New Mexico Environment Department's monitoring. And so, again, that was one of those monitoring stations that was not operating at the time of the fire that blew smoke out the salt shaft on February 5th or subsequently. So, In some cases, there's redundant monitoring. In other words, some of the stationary monitoring, several places have co-located monitoring there. In the case of the salt shaft, and there is historic data there, but there's not data 
uh, around the time of the fire or the radiation release because the environment department wasn't didn't have its monitoring operational. The EPA reviewed the air testing statistics, and according to a report in Reuters, they found discrepancies in recorded times and dates of sample collection, flawed calculation methods, conflicting data, and missing documents, and also found that the facility sometimes said air samples contained no detectable levels of radiation when measurable levels were present. To what can we attribute this degree of discrepancy, was it accidental perhaps? Was it an intentional covering up? Do you have any read on this at all? Well, the answer is we don't know. We don't know also beyond what you've just reported. We still don't know, in my view, what are the more important questions. Why did the DOE monitoring on February 15th of the workers and the equipment and the site show no contamination when in fact 22 workers were contaminated. Why did it take in one case two months for the worker to even be told that he was contaminated? So to me those are actually the more significant questions which haven't been addressed. The discussion of the discrepancies doesn't address why these things occurred, so we don't know. My general feeling at this point, pending some additional investigation and data, is a lot of it was inadequate equipment and monitoring by the WIP and contractor workers as opposed to trying to cover up anything. After all, some of the people who were contaminated were precisely the people who were doing the monitoring of other folks. So there's no real reason that I know that they would want to cover up somebody else's contamination because they themselves were contaminated. It's all a very difficult situation, and the fact that we're now almost seven months after the event and none of these basic things, including the cause of the release and how do we know it can't happen again, are still unknown. WIP officials are continuing to say that no one was badly hurt, even though 22 workers were exposed to radiation. But they do not make a distinction between the dangers of external radiation, meaning you get it on your skin, or internal, meaning it was inhaled or ingested in some way. And I believe that the workers who were contaminated were shown to have internal contamination. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, the 22 workers that showed internal contamination, 21 workers, that was confirmed by fecal bioassay sampling, and the 22nd worker was confirmed by urine sampling. So, yes, they were internally contaminated. I've always strongly objected to the fact that the health insurance programs for those workers did not provide and pay for a second opinion, in other words, uh, allowing each of the 22 workers to see their own medical doctor or more preferably medical people experienced in diagnosing and treating uh, internal radiation contamination. So as far as we know, none of those 22 workers actually have had an independent analysis by a trained professional. So that's a problem. I guess it's also important to say that the Department of Energy on the fire, we now know that at least one of the workers exposed to smoke inhalation on the fire on February 5th has been determined to be permanently disabled. He has now filed suit against the contractor over their errors related to his smoke inhalation. Again, there's no indication that he was contaminated with radioactivity, but his smoke inhalation is, is bad enough that he has great difficulty breathing, talking, and is permanently disabled but has to come as far as Albuquerque and Denver to get treatment. Um, so I don't call that no harm, nobody being injured. To me, that's a very serious injury. That is. And another point about the internal contamination is that radiation, unless one is exposed to a catastrophic dose, doesn't make its presence known in a person's health immediately. If there were to be leukemia or thyroid cancer, that would take three to five years to show up. Hard tumors could take anywhere from 12 to 15 years to show up. So it strikes me that with officials saying no one was badly hurt does not mean that there aren't going to be consequences showing up down the line that could be catastrophic to these people's lives. Well, that's why I've argued that each of those 22 workers should have been able to get independent qualified medical uh, examination and treatment, and they have not been. 
those 22 workers should have enhanced medical monitoring from now for the rest of their lives, in my view, so that the kinds of things you were talking about in so far as they occur are diagnosed in, in the earliest possible stages. So mitigating treatment should be done. That's not adequate, but that's probably the best we can do at this point. I mean, there are chelating agents that can help get some of the internal exposure out, but there are only five doses of those drugs on the WIP site on February 14th. So five total? None, Excuse me. Five, five total doses. Five total doses. None of the workers actually received any of those doses, but even if they were treating workers, somebody would have had to play God and say which workers were going to get the chelating agents and which ones weren't. This is just another level of the problems that existed and, frankly, are still not being solved, in my view. Detoxification should have been started immediately, and it still should be done. Liquid zeolite, or I mean, there are a lot of different substances that can help. What I'd like to do now is just shift this slightly to what the official stamp is with some quotes from Department of Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz who on August 12th, I believe, was down in Carlsbad and spoke. And among the things that he said was that WIP will be restored to full operation. My message is we are going to stick together. You stick with us, we will stick with you, and we will get the job done. And then Secretary Moniz went on to say, I can't stand here and say there won't be some bumps in the road on that. A major understatement. And the wording that he used at the end was, right now the major focus is on recovery, understanding and recovery. We still have work to do, but it is happening. Now, to me, that sounds like official political blather covering one's posterior. What's your take on what his visit meant and what he was saying? So I was actually in Carlsbad on August the 11th and attended his town hall meeting, and my most immediate feeling was this is 25 years ago all over again, because 25 years ago, then DOE Secretary James Watkins was saying that WIP would be opened for the first time in a year or two. It took 10. So for this secretary to say we're going to get it reopened, um, as I say, it was to me a very much sort of flashback to 25 years, and it was not something that was very believable in my mind. Importantly, though, and maybe it was just because I'm the one that asked the questions, but I asked him two questions at that town hall meeting that he didn't have answers to, which are two very key questions in, in my view. One was, what's the acceptable level of decontamination of the underground at WIP? And the second was, what's the acceptable level of worker exposures during the recovery and if WIP were reopened? And his quote was, I can't give you a number. This is a nuclear physicist who knows about numbers and contamination and decontamination. There are numbers that go with that, occupational exposure. There are numbers that go with that. He didn't have them. So my conclusion is that what DOE wants to do in their recovery plan that they're talking about is to not have any standards about what would be good enough decontamination, what would be good enough levels of worker exposure so that whatever happens, they can say, well, you know, we didn't exceed our limits because there aren't limits, or they can change limits at the drop of a hat. So. Again, this is another indication that the problems that were existent in February that were shown in the fire and the radiation release still aren't being addressed, unfortunately not being addressed by even the top person with the Secretary of the Department of Energy. Anything you want to add at this time? Well, this is unfortunately a continuing sorry story, so <laughs> there will undoubtedly be more news to report. That was Don Hancock, Executive Director of the Nuclear Research and Information Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Activist shout out, Rio de Janeiro's Atomic Can is coming to Berlin. The Uranium Film Festival 
powered by its director general Norbert Schukeneck and crew, is showcasing nuclear films in Berlin, September 29th, my birthday, yay, to October 3rd, 2014. Atomic bombs, nuclear power plants, nuclear waste, uranium mining, and depleted uranium weapons, and those are just the comedies. Just kidding, and all kidding aside, all the muck that the nuclear, industrial, military, political complex does not want you to think or know about will be brought to you in fiercely, passionately produced films that do not mince words or images. Wish I could be there to join you. This important independent film festival that was born in Rio de Janeiro now travels the world. If you can get to Berlin to see these films, please do so, and then let us know what you thought of them. You can contact them for more information at uraniumfilmfestival.org. Here's today's final thought. I'm pretty much all thought out. So instead, I'm reaching out to a listener who contacted me in June about Nuclear Hot Seat possibly expanding into a radio station in Oregon. I found some of my notes from our discussion, but misplaced your name and email address. So please, reach out again so that we may continue the conversation. Send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com and please include some statement or comment that will allow me to know that this is you and that this is a continuation of our conversation. Here's why. Nuclear trolls, those lovable little nerds, keep sending transparently obvious spam email to me trying to get me to click on a link that is obviously intended to melt my computer from the inside out. The latest attempt tried to get me to download a document by making it sound like it came from one of my contacts. There were so many mistakes and clues and big red arrows pointing at the eh, don't do it, eh, don't do it in my brain, that I'm not even going to mention the specifics in case they want to try this again. I mean, I need my comic relief, and the nuclear industry trolls are so good at providing me opportunities to laugh myself silly. But man, nuclear industry, with all of your million dollars a day per reactor in profit, you're paying for this? You might want to include an IQ test before you hire any more trolls because what you're doing is a stupid waste of time, energy, and money. Then again, so is the entire nuclear industry. So I just guess that you are staying true to form. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, September 2nd, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, AFP, Bloomberg, Informable, and Lucas Hickson, our friend, dunrenard.wordpress.com, Asahi Shimbun, Our Planet TV, Fukushima Voice, Tepco, Kyoto News, mothballmillstone.org, WashingtonPost.com, The Nuclear Free Campaign of the Sierra Club and Erica Gray, The Nuclear Resistor, Haida Gawai Observer, the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, cricket.biol.sc.edu, and the ever-vigilant, always wonderful, and extremely adorable Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Join us, friend us, tweet to John Stewart about us. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weber. Looks like Weber, sounds like Weber. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV and is also available on AirProgressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can get it by subscribing under podcasts, and then you can also search it out on the newly searchable website, NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halady and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but you've got fair use coming at you from all directions, as long as you are a not-for-profit group, individual, blog, or website. You have my permission to reuse this material as long as proper attribution is provided. That would be my name and the website. Easy enough to do. If you are a for-profit group or organization or media outlet, I'm extremely reasonable. Let me know. 
Let's talk and keep it above board. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications. Fuel pool at Unit 3 at Fukushima Daiichi. The operating console of the fuel handling machine slipped loose and fell into the pool, adding more debris. The console, which is about 1 meter wide and 1.6 meters high, weighing 400 kilograms, or to translate that into American, is 3 feet wide by 5.5 feet high and weighs 881 pounds, was being moved by TEPCO in attempts to clean up the site. This according to one of their spokes models. At this time, the company is unable to say whether the accident further damaged any of the plutonium lace fuel rods, of which 566 still remain in the Unit 3 spent fuel pool. TEPCO said it had not detected any significant changes in radiation readings or in the level of the pool water in the number three reactor. They did not define what they meant by significant as opposed to insignificant, and they also didn't bother to say whether they were looking for radiation at all, simply that they had not detected any. In a blatant reminder of the ongoing fragility of the area, only hours after the accident happened, a magnitude 5.0 quake struck off the Fukushima coast, adding insult to planetary injury. Less than three and a half years since the Fukushima Daiichi disaster began, thyroid cancer rates have soared in Fukushima Prefecture with 104 young people having been diagnosed already. This is an average of 34.8% people per population of 100,000 having definitive or suspected thyroid gland cancer. This figure is much higher than the average rate of thyroid cancer of 1.7 people per 100,000 among those in their late teens. Experts, remember those nuclear experts who so limited, in part because Japanese courts do not allow for class action cases or punitive damages and partly because of a five-decade-old nuclear accident law limiting liability to the plant operator, not unlike Price Anderson, which we have here in the United States. And by the way, if you haven't checked your homeowner's insurance, under the standard exemptions, you will find anything that happens to your home or property because of a nuclear accident. Just thought it was the right time to slip that little factoid in. Getting back to the compensation variables when it comes to those people whose lives were most deeply impacted by the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, this piece of bad news. The Japanese Governmental Nuclear Damage Claim Dispute Resolution Center, which is tasked with reaching out-of-court settlements for individual claims filed over the Fukushima nuclear plant meltdowns, has set compensation uniformly at 50% this according to a document obtained by the Manichi Shimbun. The center calculates the total amount of damages for pain and suffering in individual settlement proposals. Of course, the center denied that the 50% rule had been an official practice. But on July 9th, the Manichi Shimbun reported that Hiroshi Noyama, former head of the Nuclear Damage Claim Dispute Resolution Mediation Office, had attested during an interview that, quote, the decision had been made to assess the contribution ratio of the nuclear accident to the deaths at around 50%. And, of course, the center continued to deny it, most recently through Noyama's successor, Joji Danto, a former judge. He said, I don't know what Noyama said, but there are no rules in place. However, The four-page document obtained by the Manichi Shinbun, dated December 26, 2012. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, two interviews, and they're both powerhouses. We talk with Beyond Nuclear's Kevin Camps. 
who translates and interprets for us last week's devastating Nuclear Regulatory Commission session, which slid through the cracks while we were all looking ahead to the three-day Labor Day weekend. Conflict of interest, grounds for congressional intervention, short-sightedness as to people, the environment, and the future of our genetic material. It's a mess worthy of a soap opera, courtesy the NRC. And Kevin Camps cuts through the bovine feces to the hardcore truth. Then, what has been going on at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico, in the more than six months since the Valentine's Day radiation leak? We check back with Don Hancock of Southwest Information and Research Center to hear what has and has not happened to the 22 confirmed exposed workers and then puts Energy Secretary Ernest Moniz's bovine feces in historical perspective. Plus, we of course have numbnuts of the week, activist shoutouts, Ginzu knives, no, not really any Ginzu knives, they're made in Japan and we really don't want them here, and much, much more coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, September 2nd, 2014, and here is the week's anti-nuclear news. We'll start out in Japan this week, where Tokyo Electric Power Company is saying oops all over again. That's because on Friday, August 29, during a remotely controlled operation to remove debris from the spent killed herself a few months after the nuclear meltdown in the wake of the earthquake and tsunami, forced them out of their home, and destroyed their livelihoods. This ruling marks the first time that TEPCO has been found liable for a suicide resulting from the accident, and it could galvanize others seeking redress from the company. Watanabe said at a news conference after the ruling last Tuesday, I think we received a meaningful ruling that's consistent with our feelings. The family's suffering and pain are rewarded. When I return home, I'd like to report the result to Hamako's portrait and tell her to have a good rest. The family's attorney declared the verdict a complete victory. For its part, TEPCO, which has been widely faulted for its slow and muddled response to the disaster, issued an apology. Yoshimi Hitoshugi, a spokesman for the company, said, We apologize from the bottom of our hearts again that the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant accident is causing much inconvenience and concern to Fukushima prefectural residents and many people. What thesaurus did he or his writers go through to come up with those mashed potato, mush mouth descriptions for the worst nuclear accident in the history of the earth and the devastation that it has wrecked upon the Japanese people? Oh, and the rest of us as well. Inconvenience. Concern. He went on to say, Also, we offer our sincerest prayers for the late Mrs. Hamako Watanabe's soul. And then went on to say, We will closely examine the content of the ruling and continue to respond sincerely. Yes, I'm sure all sincerity will be reserved for your shareholders and executive bonuses. This ruling does mark a major blow to TEPCO. Legal action relating to the accident has been often get it wrong. Experts are divided over whether the cases of thyroid gland cancer should be linked to the 2011 nuclear accident. Dudes, what other variable is there that would account for such a dramatic increase in cancer rates? By means of comparison... Nagasaki University conducted screening tests on thyroid cancer in contaminated areas in Chernobyl and found that there were 31 cases of thyroid cancer out of 100,000 people tested in Korosten in the state of Zhivnomir and 22 cases of thyroid cancer in Kiev in Ukraine. So all you experts in Japan, nuclear accident happens, thyroid cancer rate increases, It happened in Chernobyl. You might want to consider it in relationship to your increased rates of thyroid cancer in proximity to Fukushima. In case you needed a reminder as to how lethal Fukushima remains, on August 28th, TEPCO admitted that 
still flowing into the water of the ocean daily from Fukushima Daiichi is water containing 5 billion becquerels of strontium-90, 2 billion becquerels of cesium-137, and 15 billion becquerels of tritium, making the total daily outflow into the port 22 billion becquerels of radiation. It's been that way from the start, and it continues to this day. For the first time, a court in Japan found nuclear power company TEPCO can be held responsible for the suicide of a woman who was forced to evacuate her home after the 2011 Fukushima disaster began. The court ordered TEPCO to pay $470,000 to Mikio Watanabe and his children after his 58-year-old wife, Hama 